Yes, recording. Can you see slides? Yes. Awesome. So, I've one that's coming. So, uh, this is an article I was reading last week. Um, it actually, it, I think, came out in the autumn, but I, I had completely, it completely passed me by. Um, and it's very interesting for a lot of reasons. It's methodologically interesting. It's quite interesting in its ambition. And ultimately, the, the results are slightly disappointing. But I think it's they're kind of disappointing in quite an interesting way. So I enjoyed it. I'm just going to move your faces so I can see my slide. So uh, a little bit of background, first of all. The background is actually probably longer than what I'll say about the paper itself, because the back, background is quite difficult to understand if, if we're new to this field. So admixture is a technical term that it kind of originally comes from like crop genomics, um, but is also used by human genomics, and essentially refers to the process of mixing between two or more different genetic ancestries. So an admixed individual is an individual who carries genomic material from more than one divergent ancestry. Um, and you can have two-way admixed individuals. So African-Americans are quite a good example of this, where they're kind of 80% African, 20% European. But then there are more complex populations who have got three or even four-way admixture. And it's important to say that all humans are admixed to some extent, except for you know, population isolates who haven't moved throughout human evolution, which don't really exist anymore. So everyone is admixed to some extent. So when we talk about admixture in terms of studying human genomics and admixture mapping, we're really thinking about recent admixture. Um, and African-Americans are an amazing example of this because obviously uh, the, the continent of the Americas was relatively recently populated by a big migration from Europe. So admixture occurs, and there's a little cartoon just on the right kind of showing how it occurs. So it occurs because of homologous recombination during meiosis. And essentially, this is the exchange of genomic material between maternal and parental uh, um, and paternal chromosomes. And so what admixture results in is this mosaic structure, where if you scan along the chromosome of an admixed individual, you, you can see that the individual haplotype blocks have got different ancestral origins. And so you can see up here in the top right is the kind of the founder population where it's kind of pure red and pure blue. And then over time, you have more and more admixture. And so over time, what you can imagine is that if you're scanning along a chromosome, the number of switches, so from one ancestry to another, becomes more and more. So this mosaic structure becomes finer and finer. So that's all the admixture is. And essentially using very clever statistical techniques, because a lot of these sequences are unique to the ancestral population, you can scan along the genome and you can actually work out which ancestral population each portion has come from. And, and that is called local ancestry. So that local ancestry is essentially the origin of each individual segment of the genome. Uh, and so you can, there are various clever algorithms for doing this, but the process of working out where a segment of genomic DNA has come from is called local ancestry uh, inference. So you can exploit admixture. And actually, admixture mapping was kind of heralded as going to be the most exciting thing in genomics quite soon after the genome was sequenced. And people thought this was going to be even more powerful than GWAS. And there are some good reasons to think that. So because you can work out where each segment of the genome has come from with local ancestry inference, you can do the same thing on a genome-wide scale. And so you can compare the local ancestry at any individual segment to the global ancestry. And if you have a disease or a trait which is more common in one ancestral population than another, then what you would expect is that at the disease causing loci or at the traits influencing loci, there should be an excess of the ancestry from the higher risk population. So something like MS, which initially we thought was much, much more common in people of European descent, we would hypothesize that if that is because of genetic factors, then when you scan along the genomes of people with MS who are admixed, there should be a peak of European ancestry compared to their global ancestry at disease loci. People, people following that so far. That's a, that's a key concept that's taken me several months to get my head around. Is that, is that relatively clear? So what I understand is that the, um, that the disease genes co-localize with the ancestry genes. Exactly. So if the disease is more common in one population than another, yeah. and if that is because of genetic factors, mm -hmm. then what you'd expect is that the genes that are causing the disease in admixed individuals would be more likely to be inherited from the higher risk population. So follow the ancestry is the 
is the strategy then. It, exactly. So this is yeah. admixture mapping. So you're yeah. scanning along the genome, you're looking for peaks of ancestry from higher risk population, yeah. hoping that those peaks will lead you to disease. Clearly, that only works if there is genuinely a difference in the incidence between the populations and if that incidence is because of genetic factors. And, the, and that is essentially that, that the concept behind admixture mapping. And this is applied quite successfully for a few diseases. So prostate cancer, hypertension, much more common in people who are in extraction. Um, MS, much more common in thoughts in people of European extraction. Sarcoidosis, SLE. So th this has been used successfully in quite a few diseases where there is a genuine genetic difference um, in terms of the architecture and the incidence. And we can see on the right, as you can just see, the, these are the MS cases actually from UK Biobank. Um, so it's the MS cases and the controls. There's about 80,000 people who don't identify as white British. And actually you, what you can see quite nicely is that the global proportion of ancestry, so the, the overall Europeanness of the MS cases um, tends to be slightly more than the controls. So that's just kind of an illustration of this finding on a global scale. And importantly, because you're, you're because you're so you're hoping to find disease genes by the peak, the admixture signal, by the excess of the higher risk ancestry, you would only expect to see that in the cases. So you can compare that to controls, and in mm -hmm. controls you don't expect to see that deviation because there may just be some parts of the genome that are more likely to be inherited um, from one ancestry. Allows you to cancel out some of that background noise. So that's admixture mapping. And essentially, this uh, this was slightly um, hyped. It was probably slightly overhyped at the beginning um, in like 2005. And there was this really, really exciting peak on chromosome one. So this, this is back in 2005. This was a relatively small admixture scan of 600 cases and 1,000 controls. Um, and this is from uh, David Reich's group, brother of Danny Reich. And they found this admixture peak in cases near the centromere of chromosome one. So this is a peak where excessive European ancestry was associated with a higher risk of MS. And basically they spent the next 15 years trying to work out what was going on, what was, what was driving that peak. And the bit more background to this is that we have, we've kind of worked out, so in the intervening 15 years, we've learned a huge amount about MS genetics in European populations. And what we found is that you know, we can explain, there's about 20% chip heritability, and we can explain about 50% of that in Europeans. And efforts to try and see whether those European risk loci explain MS risk in non-European populations have, have generally revealed that there, there is quite a lot of overlap, but they're not identical. There's a few reasons why that is the case, but I, I think there is enough uncertainty here to leave it as an open question whether the genetic architecture is truly identical. I think there's enough evidence that it's not. So what did these guys do? Well, so they basically were trying to get the bottom of this admixture peak that they found in um, uh, back in 2005. So they took 1,300 people with MS, 1,200 controls, all African-Americans from the UCSF cohort. And they genotyped them on the MS chip, which is essentially a specially designed chip to have some exome content, some ancestry informative markers. So these are markers that essentially help you with local ancestry inference. Uh, and they're markers where the allele frequencies differ quite substantially between populations. So they are ancestry informative. Knowing whether or not someone has them tells you quite a lot about what ancestry that person has come from and what ancestry that particular haplotype has there was some extra coverage as well. So this is this is the MS chip that was the, the kind of the main the main workhorse of the big uh, GWAS that was published a couple of years ago. And they used something called Ancestry Map to do admixture mapping. And they calculated these log odds scores, which are, are basically likelihood ratios, um, trying to work out how likely it is um, that that any individual peak is associated with the disease or not. So it's comparing a disease model to a null model. And they used empirical permutation-based p-values. So what did they actually find? Well, it was actually really interesting. So essentially, the effects of the admixture peak that they found at the centromere of chromosome 1 was pretty consistent from 2005 up to um, their 2007 new cohort. And then what happened after that is they recruited another 400 cases, and the signal flipped completely. And actually, it looked like there was even some evidence that an African haplotype in this, in, in this segment of DNA uh, was associated with the disease. So that was very unusual. And, and they spent quite a lot of effort trying to work out what, what had driven that flip. So were, were there some population stratification? 
with their differences in the QC and the chip genotyping and the sex makeup and the Afro-Caribbean ancestry um, in the DRB1 genotypes. And essentially they couldn't really find an explanation. So the, these guys, these 400 had a slightly lower carriage of high risk MHC haplotypes. So they have DRB1, 1501 and 03, but that didn't really explain the whole signal. So something very strange went on where basically the entire finding on which this paper kind of rested and then the motivation for doing this study essentially disappeared when they added in the new cases. And there are some very interesting possible explanations for that. The most obvious of which is that the environmental influences that these people were exposed to, these people who were diagnosed later, have changed so substantially that the, that the effect of genetics changes quite substantially. So I, I think to me, this, this screams gene environment interaction and it screams changing environment. Um, being, being paramount in NS pathogenesis. So they then basically ignored those later 400 cases where there wasn't a signal and they tried to find, find map this admixture to peak. So they were trying to work out which individual variants were driving this admixture peak. And when they did basically a normal GWAS, they couldn't find any individual genome wide hits in the African American data set. And that was what, is what you'd expect from power. But then they asked whether the top seven European SNPs in the region could explain the peak. And interesting, so these are seven European SNPs. And when you account for all of them, the, the signal association in this area in Europeans goes away. So they explain the whole signal in Europeans. And interestingly, controlling for those European tag SNPs didn't abolish the peak. So those SNPs don't explain the admixture peak. And then they did a more sophisticated uh, analysis where they're basically doing association testing for all of the big hits in the area. And they're controlling not just for genome-wide ancestry, but also for local ancestry. So they're controlling for the, the ancestral origin of the haplotypes, whether it's European, whether it's African. Um, and this, they have kind of independently come to um, the method behind a new fancy algorithm, which has just been published by the Broad Institute um, a couple of months ago, which essentially does this on a genome-wide scale. So it does GWAS on a genome-wide scale, controlling for local ancestry. So they've just focused on this one locus here. Um, but it's a very interesting idea. It's a very important idea. Um, and, and that idea on a genome-wide scale, I think is probably going to be the future of, um, of how we do analysis in, in this area. But essentially doing that, what did they find? Well, they found that two SNPs altogether explained the whole peak in the region. And they were on, one was on the long arm, one was on the short arm. And interestingly, neither of these SNPs was the top SNP in the European. So they had a SNP in CD58, and they had a SNP which was quite near the FC um, RL3 genes. And the important thing to say is that these two SNPs, A, accounted for the whole admixture mapping peak. So once you control for them, the signal goes away. They explain, they explain all of the signal. They explain all of the difference between Africans and Europeans at this locus. But they are not, B, they are not the top SNPs in Europeans. So what is this telling you? Well, it's telling you that using information from admixed individuals, from African-American individuals, allows you to zone in more carefully what are likely to be the true causal variants in the region. And, and probably the reason that these are different SNPs from Europeans is because the linkage structures are very different. So the linkage disequilibrium tagged by these two variants is generally much smaller than in Europeans and is, is slightly different as well. So this just kind of emphasizes for me, it's not actually that interesting in itself, but it, it emphasizes for me the, the amazing value of studying people um, from admixed ancestries, and in particular, people who've inherited haplotypes from African origins because the LD blocks are so much smaller. So the fine mapping benefits are huge. And just quickly, they did this on a genome-wide scale, and interestingly, nothing came out, not even the MHC. So this is a kind of genome-wide admixture scan. Um, so really, that was, that was all they had. So when you include those, the new cases, um, there was absolutely zilch across the genome. So I'd be interested to hear what people think about this. I mean, the, the main kind of talking points for me, so the, the kind of the, the take home is that this admixture peak at um, the chromosome one centromere um, seems to exist especially in the old samples. And it seems that having a European haplotype there is associated with a 50% risk increase per copy of European haplotype. Seems to be driven by two variants, which is interesting, just two variants. And in, importantly, those are not the strongest variants in Europeans. So the kind of the, the, 
question marks for me and that the interesting things to think about is why did this signal flip so strikingly in the post-2007 samples? So what has changed? And, and there are several possible explanations. There's this idea of winner's curse. So um, this is a bit like publication bias, but the idea is that we only report on associations that achieve a certain, um, a certain threshold. And this is the kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, but this is why with regression to the mean, with bigger samples, with repeated studies, a lot of those associations disappear. So there's this idea of winner's curse where um, the, the strongest associations and the first associations uh, are, are often bogus, not often disappear with bigger samples. They didn't actually adjust the confounders in the main um, linkage analysis, which I, th I think is a problem. I, d I don't think it changes much because the demographics aren't particularly unbalanced, um, but I, I think it's something that I would have probably changed. Changing genetics is possible. So we, we, you know, we've seen that this, the addition of the later samples means that the overall carriage of the high-risk um, MHC haplotypes is slightly lower. I, uh, I, I don't find that particularly satisfying explanation. If anything, the fact that they carry less of the high-risk HLA haplotypes says to me that maybe their non-MHC risk is higher. So that doesn't really explain everything. And I think possibly the most convincing explanation is that the uh, other than confounding and colliding and stuff, is that maybe the environment has changed so substantially that the environment is really trumping genetics and that we live in a society where the environmental drivers to develop MS are now so strong that those are the main drivers of your overall risk. And actually in admixed individuals, these small effects that they had picked up earlier are pale in comparison to the effects of, for example, higher rates of delayed EBV infection, higher rates of childhood obesity, higher rates of adolescent smoking. Uh, those are the main possibilities there, for me. Yeah. But if I understand it correctly, there is no reason to think that the samples from 2007 have been exposed to different environmental factors than the samples of 2005. Well, they do, I mean, we, we don't know. So the two, post 2007 samples are collected over quite a few years, so they're like over the last 10 years. But no, I mean, they don't formally record. No, but uh, why would you? Is there any? How could there be different environmental exposure? In, if they are sampled over the same time course? They're, and, they're later, they're later. So it's the later samples are where the signal seems to weaken. Yeah, yeah, I know, I, 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 yeah. I know but they, they, uh, they are included in 2007, but I assume they've also been recruited the years before and partially overlapping maybe with, with uh, samples with, with the initial cohort, no? Yeah, I mean, I think they might be partially overlapping, but they're, they're generally recruited later. I mean, the, the trend, you can even see the ones in 2007, the signal is slightly weaker. So the trend is that the later people are recruited, the weaker the signal seems to be. But we don't, we don't have details of exactly when they're recruited. Mm. It, is, it, it is interesting. Um, I yeah, I mean, that, do, yeah. So Ben, do you know if these... Um, these variants have any? Um, did they look at the functional significance in in uh, CD58 LFA3? Is an LFA yeah, LF3? Yeah. And the other so, one is a um, that's a that's the um, PR9 induced B cell proliferation. So FC receptor like protein three. So these are all immune genes. Do they affect the function of these genes? No. So they 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 do they. They do, but the story is not much more convincing than for the European variant. So it's not it's not as if they have discovered through this coding variant with a clearly deleterious effect on mm. protein function which wasn't obvious from the Europeans. So it's hypothesis. I mean, with with both of these genes, there's a slightly complicated mechanism, right? I mean, Ida, you know more about the co-simulatory expression, but it looks like this the CD58 variant, like the mm. European one, it actually decreases surface CD58 expression, which is quite odd. That's the same. That's the same mechanism as for the European. Yeah. But so Ben. So if I understood it correctly, what they so they didn't find any genome-wide um, sign, um, signal. So they went. To, they zoomed in on the chromosome one locus. They picked the seventy-nine tech snips from the European MS, the European GWAS, and then they ran these snips. Um, so the seventy-nine snips were correlated with seven tech snips. That's it. Eh? So the tech snips they had to cover the full LD. Hmm? And in Europeans. In Europeans. Europeans. And when they yeah. did, when they ran the analysis with the seven tech SNPs, they didn't find an association. So they went back to the full, the 79 SNPs covering that region. And then they, then totally other associations came out 
than in the Europeans, I mean, totally other. So the CD58 and the FCRP region came out and it's these were also, they just in the European population, they just weren't tagged as the, as the primary signal. That's- Yeah, exactly. That, that's exactly, so, yeah. So, so it, it's basically trans ethnic yeah. fine mapping by another name. So yeah. the strongest signals in Europeans, the smallest p yeah. values, are not the signals that explain this admixture peak best. So essentially by using admixture yeah. and by controlling for local ancestry, they have found what, what I think at least are more plausible candidates for the causal variant. Because yeah. in this other population with yeah. a different LD structure, these mm -hmm. are the ones that actually explain the data better. Yeah, so this, so it, it's, a, it's a kind of admixture based fine mapping. So actually it's, a, it's just another tool to fine map the, the signal actually, apart from looking at mRNA expression data at cell level, you can also look in different ancestry populations and see which one is associated associated most. It's because the LD is, yeah, yeah, I see. It's a, exactly, so, so, yeah. so this is LD-based fine yeah. mapping. Yeah, yeah, yeah using, I see what you Using mean. other populations. But you can do those other things as well. I mean, so you can do functional, functional fine mapping as well using other populations. I mean, yeah, the problem yeah, yeah. is that the data, the data are still a lot worse, but the EQTLs and the you know, the the marks of yeah. histoneless acetylation and active chromatin, whatever, they, they are all different in different populations. We just un understand them less. But so, has this actually already been been like tested on other? Because you know that for some of the signals that came out with the GMS initially, we thought, for example, I think with um, also with vitamin D. So initially there was a sort of uh, a, a tag snip that is located in an, in proximity to a vitamin D gene, but then after fine tuning, it appeared the signal didn't come from the vitamin D gene, but from another gene. That's why. I'm, so has this actually? Is there like proof of concept for other GWAS signals that is LD in a mesa eh? um, that that we, that it helps to fine tune your signal? Yeah, I mean, the, so there are still no really nice complete narratives from yeah. trans ethnic fine mapping to cause a variant to druggable target to successful drug that's mm. you know, that's a way off but yeah so, so the other the other studies that have done this have mm. been a bit more helpful so particularly the the ml1 locus so they've really helped to kind of narrow down on, on which genes there because that, that's quite a big locus mm. i think it's the ml1 where there, there are mm. loads of genes and actually using the african-american data they've yeah. been able to kind of hone in and really narrow down the number of variants and the number of conceivable genes that could account for it. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it's it, it's still very early. But other diseases where there are much bigger data sets, yes, there have been incredibly successful and mm -hmm. ethnic fine mapping efforts, which, which have revealed proper coding variants that clearly account for the signal. But they I think no, no, it's, I think it's super interesting to, um, to um, hear about the strategy, but why do it, so the fact that, so why would it be logic that they didn't have an MHC peak? Because they had power for that. No, they had more than 1,000 samples, but maybe it's because it was too overlapping with the European ancestry or something. I don't know. Why, why wouldn't there be in, in terms of analytics or statistics? Because, yeah, the, I, I, because I, I, I was, obviously if it's co-localizes with the European, so if the ancestry and the risk gene, oh no, yeah, why, 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 or it's totally different or it's, no, it should be totally different from the European ones or something. Why didn't they find it? Maybe well, no, but so, so, so either they're comparing, they're comparing the and the um, African Caribbean population, well, the African American population mainly, mm. with Europeans. They're not comparing it to another Afro African Caribbean or Afro African American population. So that's probably why you're not seeing a signal. They probably got the at risk MHC, haven't they, Benjamin? Ben? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I was a bit surprised by this as well, and I, I was wondering whether I'd misread the paper because the, so the other admixture studies have have found a clear signal at the MHC. Um, I, I did wonder whether it might be just to do with the ancestry inference because mm -hmm. so inferring local ancestry is more complicated at the MHC because the linkage structures are yeah. are so complicated. So I wondered if it was that. Um, I wasn't sure. It, it wasn't clear to me from the methods, but I, I wondered whether they actually just controlled the MHC. I, I couldn't really understand it. I, I was hoping someone would be able to. No, but I, I mean, my understanding is yeah, you've taken an enriched population. You've taken a you've taken a European population that is MHC enriched for the at-risk alleles. Okay. Mm 
you're then comparing a African American population with the European population. So they probably got if they've got the same MHCs in inverted commas, they should they should also be enriched. So therefore there won't be any difference. If, uh, so so for the the association testing that they're not comparing African Americans to Europeans, they're they're looking within the African Americans cases and controls. They have African American cases, African American controls. Essentially, they're scanning along the genome and seeing if there are peaks of European ancestry. Of the okay, so, so mm. all right, so they should they should have picked up an MHC. Then you're right. They, they, should, they should have picked it up. Yeah, I, I didn't really understand why. To be honest, um, it's a bit odd. So, so the Lisa Barcelos's group and the um, the Ashley Beach and Miami group have both found a clear MHC signal when they've done it. Mm. They, uh, they use they use different algorithms now, I think. and it's the same it's the same cohort. So I, I wondered if I was just missing something deep deep in the methods. Yeah. But the MHC signal is strong. That's at least very strange. You know, how can you not find it? I mean, you know, I don't, I don't, it looks like the, it's like a positive validation. Though, if you find it, it kind of says also there is no logical reason why they wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, I I, I just think um, I basically come full full circle on this. I think it's a really elegant idea. And like all elegant ideas, it's been, what's the, what's the, Rutherford, is it the Rutherford quote? It's a, an elegant idea has so rudely, rudely met data. Gavin or Ruth, what's the, what's the quote? I don't know. Uh, uh, Gavin, you know, it's like an elegant idea been kiboshed by some uh, ugly data. But yeah, I, so I, I think admixture mapping is, is a really nice idea, but I think it's probably not the best way to discover disease genes. So there... This new idea from the Broad, which they published back in August, published in mm -hmm. Nature Genetics, is basically doing this on a genome-wide scale. So doing a GWAS, but you know, normally you control for global ancestry by using principal components, and normally mm -hmm. you don't count the, the outliers mm -hmm. um, from, from principal components to try and make sure that you're not introducing trafication. But what you can do is, because you have now excellent ways of inferring local ancestry, Control for local ancestry as well. Mm -hmm. So it's it, it's a far more robust way of a getting rid of population stratification, b including admixed individuals, um, and c really interestingly you can actually get ancestry specific estimates. So if you know, if say I've got a chunk of DNA and I know what ancestry that's come from, but all of the variants along there, I can come up with an estimate for what those alleles do to the disease in people of Af African haplotypes, European haplotypes, South Asian haplotypes. So you can compare the effect estimates directly. Mm -hmm. it's, much, it, it's much better. So that, that is going to be the future, basically. I've changed my mind since writing the application. I'm going to do that as the primary analysis now. So Ben, I think the quote you're thinking about is uh, Thomas Huxley, the great tragedy of science, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. I got the, ro the wrong quote and the wrong person. That was, <laughs> that was what I was going for. Playing yeah. a beautiful hypothesis. Yeah. Ben, ben, which chromosome is is the HLA on? Six. So, but it looks like they just looked at chromosome one. No, yeah. uh, in the in the supplemental they hit this, so they they do do it on um, they do do it genome wide, and they don't they don't find much. But as you can see from this, this is this is noisy. This is really really noisy. I mean, it's really, really noisy, and they've they've narrowed down a lot on chromosome one. So I wonder if that's that's why the HLA has got lost. They they've got excellent coverage because it's um this is MS chip, so this is you know designed designed to have really good MHC coverage. I don't really understand. I'm I'm sure there's something I'm missing in, in the methods. Mm -hmm. It's deep, but deep hidden away. One of the but I didn't go into the supplementary. But one of the things that I was like that wasn't like commented on in the methods is how they diverse were the populations right recruited because I couldn't. There was not much of it in the methods, and I couldn't entirely deduct um, what. Yeah, you know how how they recruited the patients and how diverse they were because I can imagine, yeah, African Americans. I don't know. Is that I don't know how how homogeneous are they? Yeah, so it's so actually in terms of ancestry, quite. Yeah. So it, it, this eighty twenty African European global ancestry thing is pretty mm -hmm. consistent. Um, 
there there is a thing there is a thing in the supplemental it, it's it's all the ucsf cohort there's quite a lot of people oh, yeah. in miami um, it's basically it was a us wide effort it's a big big effort hmm. uh, yeah there's lots of miami lots of ucsf uh, a lot of vanderbilt yeah, that's pretty much it, actually. Boston, some some of the Cambridge cohort. No, Cambridge, but I, Boston, I can I just imagine, you know, if you, for example, if, for example, we in Leuven would recruit a population of Caucasians, I think 90% have four generations in Belgium, you know? So I can imagine that in terms, if you recruit African-Americans in the United States, that it's indirectly, it must be more heterogeneous than recruiting Caucasians in Europe. Especially yeah. in, in, yeah, you know, so even if, you, if you're going to recruit Caucasians in Britain, it's definitely going to be less founder. I, it's going to be more this, of the same, I think, than, I was just thinking. Yeah, no, thinking no, no that, you're, you're right. Thinking yeah, that so. that potentially might, compl I mean, might complicate the, the, the results or the, the analysis because it must be more difficult to to yeah to have them ancestry wise in line yeah i mean i think it is um, and we're still dealing quite crudely with um you know the 1000 genomes super populations or the european mm. or indian south asian east asian african which is very very crude and that crudeness is most pronounced for the african the african superpopulation because you know, we started in africa and so there is the, the most diversity is within that African superpopulation. So you're, you're right, it's a simplification. Um, a lot of it is explained by the Yoruba. So the, the Yoruba are actually pretty good for capturing a lot of the variation, but it, it, it is crude. And th this will get better. So this top med sequencing stuff that I mentioned has, has just finally been published. So they sequence like 100,000 whole genomes mm. from people from pretty diverse ancestries. So our ability to resolve subpopulations and populations within continents is going to get better mm. and better. Because um, there is there is population structure like within postcodes. Like mm. it's a very nice paper looking within the UK and you know, even you know, yeah. Within, yeah, within, within villages and towns, you see discrepancies. So Ben, um, how do they deal with long terminal repeats now in these populations, LTRs? Long terminal there. repeats, ignore them, chat them out. Mm. <laughs> so, I mean, so the chips, um, do, you mean, do you mean with sequencing or with the chips? Well, with both. I mean, what are they doing with, because uh, um, I know it's, they're, they're still having problems with LTRs, with, even with whole gen genome sequencing. So, Yeah, I mean, the, the chips are mainly designed to, to not capture that kind of thing. The chips are mainly for, for single nucleotide variants and, and indels, just because they're, they're easier to genotype. Um, oh. Yeah, I mean, the LTRs, they're, they're, they're pretty good algorithms now. I mean, I, I heard a good talk from Parkinson's people the other day um, doing STRs, which are getting better. I, LTRs, they're, they're just very difficult because, as you know, distinguishing a long mm. tandem repeat from a sequencing error where it slips mm. is very difficult with standard short reach se sequencing. So I think that advances in the algorithms and advances in like the long read sequencing so, you know there's this mm -hmm. like nanopore thing where you can basically fish through like an entire chromosome and get it all in one read that that'll probably help but i think for the for the moment i mean it's, it's not my area of expertise but I, I think for the moment it's still difficult and why are you thinking ebv Kevin? no 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 ltrs well i mean ltrs are that's where retro, that's where you know, human endogenous retroviruses um a lot of their uh, sequences are embedded in and they they alter gene expression in complex ways. Um, so, you know, until you know, the, the it'd be interesting to know if there's any LTRs in chromosome one around this, these regions, uh, because I think I think the complexity of the um, long terminal uh, and the tandem repeats. Um, you know, said, there's one particular there's one particular locus that's is it in MS is an LTR. It's actually an LTR. Um, and I'm thinking it's on chromosome, I think it's one of the chromosome X ones, actually. Um, uh, very, very close to a long time repeat. So just keep that in mind. And, you know, I think we, we, ha we have to work out what those um, LTRs are doing. Um, 
So is this depress you or excite you, Ben? I think it's quite exciting. I, I think it's probably the death knell for admixture mapping, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but I think that leaves an, an exciting opportunity to try other approaches. Um, yeah, I, we, we, need to, we need to stop pissing around with chip genus, I think. Um, yeah. I won't say that in the thing because we only have money to do chip genus, I think. But we need to start sequencing and we need to build bigger repositories and probably use other techniques. How much is the how much is the cost now of a whole genome sequence? 